Hi everyone, my name is Eric Piepenberg. I'm the Features Editor at Sereno Coin. And I want to welcome all of you to our very first The Power of Panel Discussion, uh, which is going to be a series that Sereno Coin is doing throughout the year. Uh, and today we are talking about the power of design. And I can't think of a better place to talk about the power of design than at Moxie Times Square and the gorgeous space that we are in called the Elephant Room. Uh, if any of you are taking photos of this space or anywhere in the hotel, uh, I encourage you uh, to use the hashtag at the Moxie um, because our friends here at uh, Moxie Times Square have been very helpful uh, in, in putting this event together. Um, also, the power of is another hashtag that uh, we'd like you to use, uh, Serena Coin. Uh, if you are writing about this on social media, uh, we would appreciate that. Um, we are here today to talk with four pros about um, what makes good design, how smart ideas and compelling artwork come together to make some really great design. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna ask our panelists some questions. Uh, I gave them a little bit of homework before today, so I uh, think you're gonna enjoy the homework uh, that they've, uh, the answer to that homework, I think you're gonna enjoy. And then we have some time at the end for questions from the audience, and then plenty of time after our discussion for food uh, and drinks. Um, back there. So let's get started with introductions. Uh, to my left is uh, Peter Negrini. Uh, he's been a projection designer for 15 years. His work can currently be seen on Broadway in SpongeBob SquarePants and Dear Evan Hansen. His design has also been seen at the Public Theater, Santa Fe Opera, and Yale Rep. In addition to his work in the theater, he also designs in other contexts, including the Grace Jones Hurricane Tour, I love that, that's fabulous. <laughs> Blind Date, an evening uh, long dance piece for Vilti Jones, and he was a founding member of Nature Theater of Oklahoma, which is actually one of my favorite New York based theater companies. Uh, up next is Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations, which is expected to be on Broadway next season. Uh, to his left is Victor Williams. Uh, Victor is currently the international art director of Time where one of his primary responsibilities is creating covers for all international editions. He also shapes visual standards for time and all electronic media. His previous experience includes art director roles at People Magazine, Cranes, and Sports Illustrated. His career began with an internship at Life. To his left is Kat Murata Hertzfeld. Kat has been with Sereno Coin for almost 13 years, where she started out in print production before moving into the digital space. She's a graduate of the College for Creative Studies in Detroit uh, and has a UX UI certification from General Assembly. And for those of you who don't know what UX UI is, we're gonna get to that very shortly. <laughs> when Kat isn't road, I love this. When Kat isn't road tripping with her husband, she can be found updating her fantasy football rosters at a fish concert. <laughs> we, might, <laughs> we might get into that too, Kat. Uh, and finally, Stephen Firm. Stephen is an associate professor of fashion at Parsons School of Design. A Parsons Designer of the Year nominee, he began teaching in 1998 while working for several designers, including Mark Jacobs and Donna Karen. He has taught and lectured for Harvard, MIT, and many other universities. Uh, Stephen earned his BFA from Parsons in Fashion Design and has a master's from Harvard's Graduate School of Education. So a big warm welcome to all of our panelists today. So Peter, I wanted to start with you, um, a projection designer on Broadway. For someone who has no, and this room might know what a projection designer is, but if there's anyone here who doesn't know some of the um, demands placed on a projection designer, some of the design principles that go into your work, tell us a little bit about what a projection diner, designer does. Sure, I mean, what it, projection design is sort of a relatively new discipline in the theater or not. I mean, it, it, you know, we've used projected images in the theater for, mm, 20 years, or another way you count, 60 years, or Laterna Magica in 19th century France, so then we're at 120 years, or shadow puppets, and you're back at, you know, 1,000 years or 2,000 years with Balinese shadow puppets. So it's been around, but I think that what is, it's evolved into now, it, and really evolved into with the advent of the way we've brought digital technology into the theater, is, um, my responsibility is, is any time we're putting a moving image on stage, and by, I mean, I hesitate to say moving images because sometimes they don't move, <laughs> uh, but, you know, 
or a, a static but potentially ephemeral image on stage. So it's not scenery, it's not costumes, it is not light in that it has content or has the potential for actual content in the way that light does not. Um, and I think that from a design perspective, what you know, so there's a lot of technical things that go along with that. I have a lot of technical responsibilities about how those things end up on stage, but all of that is sort of secondary to what it is. What are the images that are on stage and why are they there? And I think that functionally what gets, what I'm most excited about is I think what we're doing in the theater, all of us in the theater and projection designers in particular are absorbing this sort of great sea change which is the advent of the motion picture. You, you know, if you think about the this history of the theater, like, okay, casually you get to 2,000 years. Well, the motion picture is 120 years old, 130 years old, but really as a mass market phenomenon, it's less than 100 years old. So from the perspective of the theater, it's really new. And in the same way that, you know, Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, and then everything in the theater changed, you know, out with the verse and in with, <laughs> with, with non-verse dialogue, that's what I think the theater is doing right now, is absorbing all of these, these ways that stories are told in the motion picture and folding them into the theater. So that's like a very grandiose notion of what I do. Well, but <laughs> I mean, that brings me to your specific shows that people can see on Broadway right now. I can't think of two shows that probably, I'm guessing, right. require very different considerations than SpongeBob and Dear Evan Hansen. Talk about the differences between the projection design for both of those shows. I mean, yes, different. Um, yeah. th they are vastly different, but you know, at, at their core, it's the same puzzle. I mean, when, you know, which is true for any theater designer and dare I say any designer, what we're ultimately doing is, is, is creating a world and telling a story. So, so while the, the implementation of those two ideas are so vastly different, um, that, that kernel is the same. I think what is, you know, from an approach as a designer, that's what's, what's so different about those two things is for Dear Evan Hansen, the aesthetics were almost secondary. There was a, there was a sort of, terrifying and exhilarating moment when we were making Dervin Hansen. Um, we did a workshop production that had the eight primary cast members and an additional chorus of seven people, which is a very standard way to structure a musical. You want to figure out how to tell a story about everybody else. What you do is you build yourself a chorus of seven other people and they represent the world at large. We finished the workshop and we said, that's not the way to tell our story. And we cut seven cast members from the show and we said that the projection is gonna do that. The entire world outside of the seven principal characters is going to be told through projection. And that was vastly beyond what does it look like. That is, that is projection being a way of putting people and ideas on stage. That is not something we had to do with SpongeBob. Like SpongeBob <laughs> is a totally different problem of, you know, and, and I think a problem that, that of which projection was one of the many design contributors, which was a problem of adaptation, which were at different hands and the wonderful and terrifying thing is that we were starting with, we we're starting, you know, making whole cloth. There was no pre-existing idea, intellectual property, anything that we were dealing with. Whereas SpongeBob, it was really about adaptation. And, but I think what was, what was fascinating there, and so it, the way it ultimately ties into that problem that we had with Jarvin Hansen is that it, adaptation alone wasn't really enough for SpongeBob. Like one of the things that I think is so striking about that production is that SpongeBob SquarePants is played by a guy in a short sleeve yellow shirt and plaid pants, and that's it. Like, it's just a guy wearing a yellow shirt. And one of the best, best moments when we knew we were like, okay, maybe we're headed in the right direction, was the moment that we did a focus group after one of the early workshops, and an eight-year-old said, it was so great to finally see the real SpongeBob, not just the cartoon. <laughs> that's great. And so that, you know, I think that's a thing about the, 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 what's different is like, but still coming into it with the, we're making a whole world. Yeah. You know, not just an adaptation. We have to make the whole world every time. And that, that's a good way to move into to, to what Victor uh, does, talking about uh, creating a, a world. And now I'm gonna sound old school here, but I love a good magazine that I can hold in my hands, that I can turn the pages, and that has a, a, a really strong 
story, uh, but in one 2D image. Um, and I can't think of a magazine out there that is sort of has this um, iconic, if time has you on their cover, that means that it's pretty important. Tell us about some of the cons uh, design considerations that go into what you do, because not only does it have to look good, but it has to be newsy, it has to yes. be newsworthy. Yeah. So first, I thank you, and I'll, I'll pay you for your love of magazines <laughs> later. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, but in this you know increasingly almost entirely digital world, magazines, a magazine cover, and I'm fortunate to work at one of the few publications that actually still has the, the cover has resonance. That real estate has resonance. It has meaning when we frame something on the cover. It has meaning, and, and, and what you said earlier about you know you know I thoroughly agree, and obviously I'm in this discipline, and so I I believe that you know design is storytelling and it's narrative and you're essentially you're trying to get every user to engage with the narrative so that they how their story intersects with the story that we're telling you you know so so for example like back to your initial question time anytime we frame anything in that in that red border uh, we it t it tends to be elevated and even in, in, in this digital world that cover still is resonance I work there and I can't tell you what was in the magazine four weeks ago, like in terms of individual stories. But I can always tell you what's on the cover, because what's on the cover is the, our, 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 the drive. When we're, when we're hitting the sweet spot, telling our best, it's a, the, you know, the national zeitgeist. What, we, what we're talking about, what's happening, um, and, and what we should be thinking about. And even now as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about I know what's coming up in another week or what we're thinking about and how we're thinking about framing it. And many times we'll get something on the cover and we'll say, this isn't a cover. Mm. This doesn't work. The story is not broad enough. It doesn't. It's not applicable to enough human beings. It's, it's important to, you know, thirty thousand people. It's not important to thirty million people. Mm. You know, it's just. It's not. That's that's where we. That's the space we live in. At this, at this point. Victor, can you be specific? Is there a specific magazine in the work that you've done at that time that has a backstory that sort of answered all of those questions, those the newsworthiness, the, the, the needs of good design uh, mm -hmm. that you feel has, a, has stuck with you in some way? Yeah, uh, let's, I mean, does everyone, everyone probably remembers the, uh, I think it's MH370, that Malaysian airplane that disappeared mm -hmm. a couple years ago. Uh, we were tr attempting to tell a story about this, this missing aircraft. And the thing about it is like, so every, almost everyone flies, we get on airplanes, we have this, you know, I fly reasonably frequently. I have a lot of family out in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. You know, so it's 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 an existential fear you have of you know, you just make your peace with it and you fly. But we uh, uh, we were attempting to figure out what do we say about this. A, there's no picture that can tell the story, no mm -hmm. photograph that can tell the story about a missing aircraft. Uh, it's a story that. Uh, intersects with, you know, it's, it's, it's about a primal fear, it's about something we're afraid of, but it's an important story. It's, you know, we have, we have reporters who will, you know, the focus of the story ended up being about the pilot and, you know, what happened, what potential paths they could have taken. So it gets very granular when you get into the story, but the co cover has to, focus, uh, has to function as a poster, as a shorthand. And so my solution for that was, ended up hiring a, uh, a, a brilliant, Illustrator, who's a conceptual illustrator, Ben Weissman, who created this. Um, very, he created dozens of graphic solutions, actually, but he created the solution where it's the cover and it's just a series of lines, and you could barely, you could barely make out the, the plane on the cover. It's almost the plane was hiding, hidden up on the cover, mm. and the only line said the mystery of Flight 370. Mm. And that, you know, that, the, that when, once we got there, we realized this is the cover. Yeah. You know, we get in the room, we all look at it, and this is the cover. So it's it's. It's about this narrative that involves all of us. So yes, it did happen in Malaysia, but we we're all involved in it. We're all you're at stake, and you're, you, you've, you've, you've pulled the reader, the viewer, into this narrative, the story. Uh, Kat, let me jump to you. Um, and before this panel, Kat and I had a conversation about just some things that would come up, and she mentioned, in talking about the new Sereno coin, the the new redesign of the Sereno coin website, which happened in January, and Kat was instrumental in, in uh, the the team that made that happen, she mentioned something called the Norman door or Norman doors, Norman and doors. I had no idea what a Norman door was at all, and so Kat is now going to talk to us about how what the Norman door has to do with the principles of design and storytelling that went into the new Sereno Coin website because I, I, 
Still not sure, but I think you're going <laughs> to explain to us exactly how that works. And Eric, also what UX... This is my favorite thing to talk about. I know. Compare and also yourself. what UX UI has to do with... So so weave the Norman door into all of that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so my first question for all of you, have any of you heard of the Norman door or the phrase the Norman door? No. Okay. Okay. So I don't um, feel so, so bad. So okay. have you ever been walking through a building and there's a set of doors and you see a handle and you pull it? and it's like this, and then you realize that there's a sign that says push. And it's like, well, this shape told me to pull it, but now there's a sign saying push it, and you have that moment of friction, and your day is disrupted slightly, but you have somewhere to go, so you just go, you either blame yourself, or you blame the door, but regardless, you keep going. When we're thinking about websites and behavior of websites, we have a much shorter span with, with people that enter. So now we think about the design of websites and what that means and what our users' goals are. Um, and if we, through visual cues and copy cues, are telling people to do the right thing, they won't experience that moment of friction. If we don't do our job correctly, they have that moment of friction and there's no guarantee they're gonna keep going down that path. So it's our job as user experience designers to make sure that user doesn't hit that moment of friction by designing certain things like buttons that clearly look like a button so that their copy can speak to what the expectation is. I know some of us have had this very annoying experience. I, I think like there's some airlines have it. You go through, you fill out the form and at the end you hit the button and it resets. Mm. Yeah, there's, and it's like, you know what? I'm not going to go to Miami this weekend. Uh, um, I already filled that out, and now I've changed my mind. I can't afford it. Um, yeah, and so a lot of that is our, our, what we expect is that we're hitting submit. So when that button is the right, is in the wrong spot, the wrong thing happens, and that's a very frustrating experience. And if you are a retailer, or no matter what the goal is, now people have abandoned you. So we want to make sure, as user experience designers, not only are we bringing the aesthetics to the story and the technology to the story, but also the people who it's for. We're building this for people that are not us, and we need to make sure that we understand the psychology behind this design. What what go? I'm, this is very specific. What goes into a really good button? What what are some design <laughs> qualities that a button really needs to have on a website to make it functional, to make it easy to, to find and use? Clarity. Okay. And I think right off the bat, you know, a lot of the the sites that we design, we're selling. Maybe we're selling a ticket. Something to that really consider when you're looking at your overall design. If you make it slightly harder for a user to find that button, you make it slightly harder for a user to buy a ticket. Mm. And so when we think about um, what is looking through something with a digital lens, it's really about, it's not like, oh, I like pink or blue or purple and I'm gonna make the button that color. It's like more of, it's not noticeable enough. Maybe it's not centered, maybe it's not bright enough, maybe there's not enough contrast. So we just make sure that we understand what the goals of that user is, what we want them to do, and make sure they can accomplish that. So uh, in terms of buttons, and I'm going to say this right now, I can't stand click here. <laughs> that makes me insane. Because I see buttons all the time. It's like, click here. And it's like, oh, and elephants are going to come out of my computer. What's going right. to happen when right. I click here? It's like, I want to know what's going to happen, what action is going to occur. Mm -hmm. And also, if the button is designed well, People know that it's clickable, so just give them something a little bit more. Um, an example, we just had our first newsletter go out uh, last Thursday, and on our buttons, because the button was well-designed, we had an opportunity to be a little more playful with the copy and add some more personality. Great. Uh, Steven, I'm hoping you can wrap all of this uh, up <laughs> for <Sure>. me. <laughs> as someone who thinks about design uh, as an academic and sort of conceptually and who is teaching the next generation of designers, uh, uh, in your case fashion, about what makes good design. What, what are some of the things that design has to take into account for it to be, to, to, for it to go from being good mm -hmm. to, to great? What are some things conceptually that, that really designers have to keep in mind? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole panel, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, well, what I'm hearing from all of you is there's a narrative involved, and that narrative creates an emotion. And so what makes you pick that 
tube of toothpaste versus another? What makes you pick that t-shirt over another? And it's often the work of a designer is creating a world that you want to be a part of. And so it's no longer the artifact, it's the emotion that's connected to that artifact. And so design always has a purpose. It always has to function and function really well. <laughs> but the idea that the designer is somehow framing that through a heightened experience. And that experience can be tangible like the product or even systems based. Um, and I think you know, at Parsons, we're really reinforcing the idea that you've got kind of like this middle line. And as a designer, you straddle the two sides. And on one side, you're straddling who am I as an artist and what is that red thread that's going to unite my work, whether I'm an actual artist or, in my case, a fashion designer. But then on the right-hand side, what's the zeitgeist? And so how do I stay relevant? Mm -hmm. And so I think good design does that. It's the idea that you're not every in fashion, every single season creating something that uh, doesn't relate to my brand identity but I'm staying relevant so that I'm adjusted to the time. And I think what's interesting in fashion, I think there's, there's the perception um, that what goes down on the runway, for example, is what's gonna, what people can buy, yeah. which is not always the case. Um, and I think uh, <laughs> certain more avant-garde designers, maybe it's more about putting on a, a show conceptually, and then maybe it sort of changes when it reaches uh, the, the, the point of sale. Um, Talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of a, a fashion perspective, in terms of what a runway show can do and how what you see there actually then translates into design that, that is accessible, maybe not for everybody at every price point, but is more, more accessible than what you see conceptually on the runway. Yeah, I, I think it's almost like a two-pronged approach to that. And, and I first want to touch on what Victor said, because it's so fascinating. Your field has to cover a mass design, because it's becoming so, demo it is democratized, it's becoming a little bit more um, designed to a subculture and a sub-subculture. And so we're creating these worlds where you want to be a part of it, but it has to be so specific because the second you try to be everything to everyone, suddenly your message is watered. And you don't have that, wor that specific world that we want to be a part of. And so the runway show today, it's not about the clothing. It's really, I was talking to a colleague the other day and I said, it's really just a mood board. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's theater, it's to get press, it's an advertisement. And so you see this hyper sensationalized world and then you go into the store and it's filtered for you for a more accessible product. And for some of us that means something that's still very experimental and experiential. Others of us it's, we're going in to buy a white t-shirt because it's of that world. We want that identity. Mm -hmm. And then for others, it's the perfume and the bed sheets. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, I want to make sure we get some time for questions uh, from the audience, but I want to move right into the homework that I gave everyone. Mm. I asked all of our panelists to come up with one element of design. It could be anything, absolutely anything, that they have always wanted to talk about in a room full of people. Uh, and each of them chose something to talk about. Um, and I don't know what they're about to say. I'm so curious to know. So Peter, why don't we start with why don't we start with you? I'll give you know maybe two, sure. two three minutes uh, per person. But let's start with uh, your okay. object. I brought mine. It's in my back pocket. Okay. Um, it's a corkscrew. <laughs> it belonged to my grandfather, uh, who didn't drink wine, as far as I know. So I don't <laughs> quite know why he owned it. But the reason why I brought it, and the reason I'm fascinated by it, I love it. Every time someone comes to my house, they, they, they have trouble using it. And it's in part because the design of it is deceptively simple. I mean, all you do is um, you just continually twist. <laughs> and that's all you do. That's all you have to do is just keep twisting this and it'll pull the cork out of your bottle. And everyone thinks that it must be more complicated than that. Mm. And, and, and so it's like part of what I, I, and I was sort of trying to find this object, and I have the idea of the one object that I want to talk about, like it, that was really troubling. It was the one part that was so right. hard. Sure. Um, but what, so trying to figure out how that is something that's meaningful in, in, in relation to what I do. And it, I was, first of all, I think that what is a, something I always try to hold on to as a theater designer, I can do anything. Like, I really can kind of do anything I want. I have this great luxury that I don't think any of you have, which is, I got you for a couple hours. 
Like, I don't <laughs> have to get you in a split second. You paid your $185 to come to a Broadway <laughs> musical. Like, I got you at least until intermission, odds are. Like, <laughs> so, you know, so that, but, but so that it's, that there's a real risk in that luxury of not believing in form follows function and believing mm. in ornament and decoration and, oh, it's pretty. Because I can't just make something pretty and people would pay me very well just to make something pretty. Yeah. But that's not actually good design, that's decoration. Right? And I like, absolutely don't believe that's what a good theater maker is doing, even if it's decorated. Right. You know, so th I was fascinated by both the sort of form follows function, good old, good old standby, but, and also the sort of surprising simplicity. It's like, it seems almost simpler than it can mm. be. You know, and that, that was sort of why I was so fascinated by the subject. And it'll continue to be in my back pocket if you want to puzzle out how it actually works. <laughs> I bet we get a bottle of wine at the bar. And <laughs> Thank you for that, Peter. Um, Victor, I, I'm going to get up and we have something to show. Oh, yeah. This is what you chose. Yes. I'll let you do the reveal. Okay. Okay. So there you go. This is your... This is what I chose. Yes. Um, now, I, that, that corrector was beautiful, actually, by the way. <laughs> I just say, but I chose something that was... You know, more connected to something that I, I do every week. And this is a, I'll just tell you this, a very quick story about this. This is the, um, so George Lois, you know, you know, famous ad man, created this uh, cover when he was the creative director of uh, Esquire in 1968 of Muhammad Ali. And uh, this references a painting, uh, The Slings of St. Sebastian. And this is after Ali, uh, this was in, so 68. So 66 was when he lost his title. So he lost four years as a conscientious, conscientious objector to the war, and that was from age 25 to about 29. So that was his prime money-earning period. And uh, this actually goes directly to the point I was making earlier about the time covers. So this is um, at a period where this man was a pariah in America, in America at this point. Uh, he was, uh, I guess, an outcast at that point. Um, and uh, George Lois was just... It's kind of hard to imagine that you're the creative director of Esquire and you're, you're taking these chances and putting this person on the cover with, you know, this is the only language on the cover. And, but what he did is he involved, he attempted to engage the American public. In a, yeah, can, the, I'm sorry, it says on the, sorry, the passion of Muhammad Ali. So, uh, and, uh, but he attempted to engage the American public in a, being a conscientious objector in the, uh, the Vietnam War all these issues of identity as an African American, it's just, it's so multi-layered and so essentially controversial. But this, George Lois and Ali eventually won. This was, this is an amazing thing. At this point, this was such a, such a risk to take. And what he did is what he communicated, what he was communicating and how he was engaging the, the, the reader in his narrative is that, um, this this person this person's story is important, but it's an American story, and it involves all of us. It's not just about this guy. It's not just about objecting to the Vietnam War. It's about um, you know um, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to object to war, to a war? What does it mean? What does it mean to what does patriotism mean? It's just this was this was deep and multi layered, especially involved in a commercial enterprise. They're about making money to take this risk. Was um, and they did lose advertisers, but eventually Esquire, you know, it was the esteem that, that they got, and they were, they gained people, they gained readers. Mm -hmm. So for me, this was this is an object that um, serves as a source of inspiration, and I've never done anything this controversial in my career at this point. But you know, there's always hope. There's always this, this yeah. hope that you could, you, could, you could do something that sure. that that iconic. And George Lois has done, you know, dozens of iconic covers, and he's for me as a magazine designer and a creator of, of you know, mini narratives on these covers. Uh, this is the kind of work that I aspire to do. So uh, this sort of work serves as an inspiration for me constantly. And I ended up meeting George Lois and talking to him, That's and great. he is a, a brilliant, sort of crazy, but really cool guy. <laughs> yeah, so, great, yeah. great. Yep. Thank you, Victor. Yep. Kat. Yes, um, and I don't know about you guys, but this was the most difficult thing as a designer to pick one thing. <laughs> to pick one thing, oh, my brain went from Marcel Duchamp to Keter Kollwitz, and I landed on this RuPaul bag. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is a cool bag. Um, so, I just to give you guys some background, I, I am such a fan of music, all music. I love it more than anything in the world, and I 
became, I started listening to music when the hair bands, like Poison Warrant, Motley Crue were still around, and then overnight, just like this, it was Nirvana, Smells Like Teen Spirit, and the grunge hit. And I would gather up my allowance, go to Strawberry's Music, and um, <laughs> get like bumper stickers, t-shirts, whatever I could afford. And one day I walked in and I saw this. And <clears throat> I had no idea what music was on it, had never heard of the band, but I saw this image and I knew right away what was probably going, it was probably going to sound like, and as a 13, 14 year old bass guitarist, a bad one, but still, I saw something where I was like, I bet there's something or someone like me involved in this. And I actually, um, for those of you who don't know, if you don't know Hole, I'm sure you've heard of Courtney Love. She's the front lady behind this. And I was attracted to it because it just was like a, such a striking image of a woman and it's powerful, but it's showing all of these things that you know, she had to put on to get to her goal. And I was reading an interview with Courtney Love, it was her concept, and she said whole, her whole idea behind it was she wanted a beauty queen with running mascara. And it's like, <laughs> I put hemorrhoid cream on my face every night and tape on my butt, but I did it, I miss congeniality. <laughs> <laughs> so I like you, this is my, this is my, That's great. I love it so much. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, <laughs> Steven, tell us about your object. I don't have an object, but I have a performance. Okay. <laughs> a performance, okay. Um, and, well, but I have images to accompany this. And so we were origi originally gonna show excerpts from the video, but I have images and I'll talk about that. And do you mind holding them as sure. I talk? Um, so to give a little context, this is early 90s. Hussein Chalain is showing out of London. And during this period, basically models just walked a runway and with some dance music and that was pretty much it. Hussein Chalain comes along and he says, you know, the future is really a multidisciplinary engagement. It's no longer designers working in their own little silos. Like, I'm a fashion designer and I'm going to tell you what you want. It's really, how do I form adjacencies with other creative practices? So he works with this furniture designer, Paul Toppin. And so the models come on the runway and they start dissecting four chairs. And these chairs turn into suitcases, clothing, becomes a living room that's dismantled. And so as they start to do this, you start to wonder around identity, diaspora, home, permanency. And at the conclusion of this, the show actually started. But what he's really talking about is in the 1970s, he grew up in Cyprus, and this is when they were going through a civil war. So his family fled to England, and so it's a real personal, social, personal commentary around his own experience, but then also the mobility of mankind, and he's trying to have a context crossover where, again, fashion can be informed by other disciplines. And Stephen, in this case, what we're looking at right now, the, the table becomes a skirt. Yeah. It, it, he pulls up the table, mm -hmm and then the model latches it under her waist and it then becomes a skirt. So it's much, much more about just idea from which the actual collection and the clothing would be created within the studio space. But what's really also very important here, especially within the context I described, he's doing this not on the conventional runway but at the Sadler Wells Theatre in London. And it started with a conventional family singing Hungarian chants. He has a Hungarian um, ethnicity as well. Um, and then the family left the stage, and then the show began. So it really was a performance. It wasn't just a show. It was multi-level of experiences. That was with the other work we saw. And I love the fact that your corkscrew, it's again, it's not just a corkscrew. It's like, why do we hang on to certain objects? It's not just a fur coat. It's my mother's fur coat. Mm -hmm. So it's an identity, much the same as your album. You saw this thing, and there's a relationship there. And so I think that's what he's trying to say. It's, it's that straddle that I was talking about. Thank you all, you, A pluses. Your homework was very, very well. You get all A pluses, thank you so much. A big applause for all of our panelists and thank you for being here as well.